Reformed Church. So you know what? There, there, there was uh, one, of the, one of the biggest differences that you see, and you see it quite a bit in the book of Romans, um, uh, is flesh and spirit, right? There, there, there was a time... There was a time where we were in the flesh, right? And, 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 and another way to talk about being in the flesh is that not only were we in the flesh, but because of the fact that we were in the flesh, right, we were, our lives consisted of a law of works, right? Now, it's, it's just the way it was. That, that's all you had, right? The, when, you, when you are in the flesh, you obviously don't have or don't, and don't live by the power of the Spirit of God. You're just in the flesh, right? You, you are not a new creation, right? Old things have not passed away. The old things are actually the current things, right? So, so when you're in the flesh, that's, that's how you're living. You're living by works. You live by what you can do, and that's it, or what someone else can do for you. That's, 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 how, that's how we used to live. Now, that, that may seem very um that 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 may seem very understandable to most people oh okay yeah of course i was in the flesh but but the thing to to really look at that is the way to look at that is to understand that that's not how you are now so if you begin to look at like what what does the life of a person in the flesh what is it like well it's like having to lean on your own understanding and not having any other understanding having to lean on your own effort and not having to lean on the effort of jesus and what god has done at all it's like it's like being being and working on your own unless another human being helps you right um it, it it's it's trusting in yourself it's trusting in men it's it's it's, it's not having, it's looking inside and agreeing with some things that you hear that are morally right, but not having the power to be able to adhere to it. It's, a, it's agreeing, it's living and agreeing that certain things are right, and then failing that, um, failing that, that standard, right? You know, th- there is this thing, and I, and I, I haven't always known this, but, you know, the, the Lord started showing me this a little bit at a time um a bit ago but when you know there was a time when i thought okay the only people that really were under the law are just the jews right that if you're a gentile you were never under something called the law but the reality though is is that you know when you're in the flesh right you're you're either under the law of moses like some people are or you are um a gentile trying to live under the law of moses or you you live under a law of your own making either way you are under a law right and you're under to make it a little bit plainer you're under a law of works right and the law of works could be the law of moses or the law of works may be some form of a law that you have uh, a standard right that you have developed for yourself that all in all is just again just a law of works and and the reason why that would agree and i'll read to you in a second where that's coming from but the, the, when you're in the flesh that's all that you have is a law of works now you could be you could be like abraham and be in the flesh and not be made a new creation but live by faith in what jesus christ was going to do right in other words in that time you could have been you could have been an individual that lived by faith in what jesus was going to come and do right and you could be a person in the flesh but yet be righteous so in your mind right you still don't 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 um you're still not a new creation, right? But you have the power of God working with you, right? So, so that there is there is definitely similitudes to how we live today, but but just going back to our present time, right? Today, you either live by by the law of works, right, or you you live by you, or, or you are born again. It, it, I think we can put it into several categories. So let's categorize it like this: You're either in the flesh, living by the law of works. Or you're born again and still living by the law of works, or you're born again, right, and and progressing in your knowledge of Christ and continuing more and more to live by faith, to live right where where that where you understand your your labor is right, what you're doing, your one thing is faith in Jesus Christ, right? So three big segments of people. So let's do this. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. I'll read this to you quick. Romans chapter 7. And look at, I think, starting with verse 
5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, and this is the King James Version, for when we were in the flesh, flesh, the motions of sin, or I think the New King James says the passions of sin maybe, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So let's go ahead, let's, let's switch over. Let me read this to you out of New King James also. Verse number 5, Romans 7, 5. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. One of, one of the things that I want to bring out of that real quick is, it says, For when, when, when we were in the flesh. When. Now, that may not seem like too big a word, but it's pretty significant to me, right? When you were in the flesh. That means you ain't now, <laughs> Right? when you were in the flesh. That means something drastically changed in the way, in this is who you used to be, and this is who you are now. You, when, when you used to be in the flesh, when you used to be in the flesh, the way that you lived then, it, and, and when you heard of the law of Moses, or when you had your own moral standard to live by, right? The moral standard they used to live by, which was the law of works, or the Ten Commandments, which you used to live by, which was the law of works, right? A, or a, I can say a law of works or the law of works, right? Either way, it was works. That, that law, right, that you lived by, what it basically did was arouse, arouse the, or get, provided even more and more desire, right, to do the very things that you were trying not to do, right? to do the very things that you were trying not to do. Uh, and, and verse number six says, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were, we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So I'm not gonna get into that entirely right now, but let's go real quick to Romans chapter two. The, 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 the main thing I wanted us to take from there is when, right, j just the when piece, when you were in the flesh. You're not now, you used to be. That, that's important. It'll continue to be important as we go through, right? Romans 2, verse 14. Romans 2, verse number 14. It says, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law. In other words, if you, the, the, the law says that uh, you shall honor your father and mother, right? Well, for a Gentile that doesn't, let's say, know at all about the law of Moses or about the Ten Commandments, and, and they believe, part of their standard or their moral code, right, is to honor their father and mother, right? Now, that honoring of their father and mother, that, that is a standard that they have, which um, you'll see it in a second, but to paraphrase it a bit, it's which pats you on the back when you do it, and punches you in the face when you don't, right? That, that is how you used to live, and that is how every person in the flesh lives, either patting themselves on the back or punching themselves in the face. All for, in other words, a, uh, uh, celebrating your, your good works, right? And, and, and condemning your failure to do what you know you should do, right? Because that's how we used to be, when we were in the flesh, right? 14 again says, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law, the work of the law, right? In other words, the works of the law, which is what the law is, right? Uh, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing them, right? In other words, when you're living under a law of works, in other words, another way of saying when you're in the flesh, right? You, your conscience either excuses what you're doing, right? Or accuses you, right? In other words, it's all about right and wrong. Did I do it right or did I do it wrong? Did I, did I do it or did I not do it? Did I, did I live up to my standard or did I fail it? Did I live up to what I think is God's standard or did I fail it, right? People that live under the Ten Commandments, that's how they live. People that live under their own moral code, that's how they live. They either accuse or excuse their behavior, right? Um, so so if, if, we, if we go from there... Um, uh, another piece that you'll see is just when we took out of Romans chapter 7, when we were in the flesh, right? Romans 8 kind of collaborates that because it continues along with the same idea. And it affirms, right, for we, for you are not in the flesh, 
but you are in the spirit. In other words, making, again, like, like I, I think of, if, you, if we, we went on Amazon not that long ago and we bought these Sharpie markers, but they weren't the Sharpie markers that had, you know, just kind of that, that fat tip. These were Sharpie markers that had a big fat tip. They were for like writing on posters, right? If you can take something that fat and that thick, so we don't think it's a thin gray line, take a big fat black line and put it in between. This is who I used to be and this is who I am today. We, for instance, we, we are not under, we are not subject and under the dominion of death, right? But yet you don't yet see that working perfectly in your life. That doesn't mean you're not, that that's not a reality of who you are. That just means you're not seeing it manifest, right? Here, you were under the dominion of death and here you're not under the dominion of death. There are things in our lives that are truths, right? And actually, I, I, just as I was thinking about this, that's kind of how I was thinking about, about it. I was saying, Lord, you know, like these are all things that are true, regardless of whether you see them manifest 100% in your life. That's not the point of what we're talking about is not what do you see manifest today is what is the truth, right? What is the truth? So, so in, 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 let's look at that. Romans, Romans 8 is what I was talking to you in verse number 5. Romans 8. In verse number five, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the thing of the flesh, on the things of the flesh. So that's exactly what we were saying before, right? When you live in the flesh, you, you set your mind on the things of the flesh. In other words, there is nothing else for you to be mindful about. There is no, there's no other way for you to live. It's the works of the flesh. So you set your mind. You're mindful of the things of the flesh. So if you have a problem, guess who you're going to rely on? Yourself. If you, if, if you hear some, some, some bad news, guess what you're going to ask? Is there something that I can do? And if not, then you just grieve and you suffer, right? Because that's all, that's all you got. You have who you are. That's all you got, or what someone else could possibly do for you. But, but ultimately, it's just you and your understanding. That, that's where you're living. Now, now, again, with that thick black, uh, thick black line in between, right, that's not where we are today, right? That's not where we live today. It says those who live, uh, live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For, and, and, and here's a little point of that. You may read that, and you may already be familiar with the fact that it says that we are not in the flesh, but we are in the spirit, right? And, but when you read that every time, you think, well, yeah, but I'm not always mindful of the things of the spirit of God. Sometimes I'm mindful of the things of the flesh. But, but, but here's the point. The point is that you can be fully, you can live that way, always mindful of the things of the spirit. Again, we're, we're not talking about that which manifests. We're talking about that which is true. The truth is that every single Christian, right, is to an extent of their knowledge mindful of the things of the spirit, right? Now, now we may not live like that all the time, but, but the difference is that this person can't be mindful of the things of the spirit, and this person here can be mindful of the things, things of the spirit, and that's where we live, right? That's where we're living. So um, verse number six says then, for to be carnally minded is death. Now, <laughs> that's back over here, right? And, and it, it is applicable to an extent, right? If you're carnally minded but you're saved, right? That, 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 that could work against you there. But, but here's the point, that when you're in the flesh, the, the, there, there is the result of anything that you do will still end in death. There's, there, it doesn't matter what your works are. Your works could sometimes live up to your moral, co moral code, and sometimes your works are not going to live up to that moral code. Your works can be according to the law of Moses sometimes, so-called, right, S supposedly according to the law, and then other times not. But the point is, you, you, whether you think Think, right, in quotes, whether you think you're doing good or bad, either way, right, the end thereof is death, right? There is nothing that an individual living in the flesh can do to produce or make the life of God affect them, right? There's, the life of God is not working in an individual like that here. And it can't work because they're not mindful of those things. They don't know it, right? They don't know the knowledge of Christ. Therefore, there is no life of God here, right? Um, 
so, so, it's, so therefore, in verse number six, it says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. That's again, that's where we live. Here, you have no capability, no power towards life, right? On this side, right, we live, we, we, the, the way that we live is according to the spirit and, and living according to the spirit, it says being mindful of those things to us, it is life and peace, right? So, so in other words, us being mindful of who we are, right, and what Christ has done, produces, right, or is, our fruitfulness is life and peace, right? Is life and peace. That, that couldn't happen before, and today it does, right? Couldn't happen before, today it does. To different extents, but it does. Verse number seven, then, um, because the carnal mind, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the, to the law of God, nor can it be, right? That's what we were saying before. The carnal mind, in other words, a fleshly mind, cannot subject itself to the law of God because it doesn't even know what that law of faith is, right? It can't be subject to faith because it doesn't even know Jesus, right? So then in, in verse number eight, it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse number nine says, but you are not. And, and, and this is just, again, you, you have to see it as a drastic, complete opposite, nothing like it, right? You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. That means you were made new, right? You received the inheritance of Jesus on the inside of you, right? You have what he has. You were made as he is in this world, right? So, so. We are not in the flesh, but we are in the spirit. So you're not there, right? You're here. There is nothing about you. There is nothing about who you actually are that is like that old man. Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing. The, 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 there, is, there are remaining thoughts, but I'm talking about who you actually are, who you actually are in the spirit. It, it is nothing like who you used to be. The thinking that is left needs to be renewed, right? Needs to, needs to be gone, needs to be out of your mind because that's thinking that's not in line with who you are. But, but again, just to solidify this, it says, but you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So if, you, if you're born again, if you have the spirit of God dwelling in you, if you're born of God, then you're in the spirit, you are not in the flesh. So any excuse that you used to have, any bondage that you used to live in, Right? And any oppression that you were suffering while you were here, right? You do not have to suffer here, right? You're not under any of that, right? In other, there's drastic differences. Here you're in bondage to the flesh. Here you're subject to the carnal mind. Here, that's not how you live, right? That's not, that's not how, that's not the truth of who you are. I should say it that way, right? So, so let, let, let's do this. Let's, when we, when we think about the law then, there is a real uh, there's, there's a real specificity to who the, the law applies to, right? And the way the Lord puts it is, who is it that the Lord that the law I should say I said the Lord, the law, who is it that the law speaks to? Because the law speaks to a, a specific individual, right? And if you are not that individual, the law is not speaking to you. So the law speaks to a specific type of person, right? To a specific type of person. Let's do this. Let's, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 19. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Now, I'll substantiate this for you in a second, but you're not under the law, <laughs> right? You're not under the law. Therefore, nothing that the law says is it addressing you, right? The law is not speaking to you, right? Now, the, the, now, there is the law of faith, right? And there is a spirit on the inside of you, and that is applicable to you. But the law of Moses is not applicable to you. In other words, it is not speaking to you. The law of Moses does not apply to you as a law. We're not saying at all that the things contained in the law are bad. It just does not apply to you as a law to live by, right? Who does the law speak to? The law speaks to those that, it, that are under the law. I mean, in, in the simplest form, right? If you don't live in New York, if you're not in New York, the laws of New York don't apply to you. If you live in Kentucky, the law of Kentucky applies to you. You're not, the law of New York cannot apply to you unless you live in New York. If you're not in New York, the, that law does not apply to you. If you're not under the law of Moses, that law does not apply to you. When we talked before about the law of works, that you are a law unto yourself, if you're no longer in the flesh, right, then that law, 
even if, though it is of your own making, is not applicable to you anymore. You don't have to live by that. You've been delivered already from that. There's no need for you to live under some sort of a moral code, but today we live and work and exercise our living in our bodies by the law of the spirit of life in Christ, right? So it says, now, it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and that the world may become guilty before God. Right? That's an important thing. In other words, living under the law brings about guilt and condemnation. Living under the law brings about guilt and condemnation because we were guilty and condemned. In other words, if you live under that law, you, you, you can't live up to that, right? You can't do that law successfully. So, so you live perpetually under guilt and condemnation. Why? Because you're, you're living under the law of Moses, right? So the law of Moses, living under that law, you will live perpetually under guilt and condemnation. Now, we, we know the verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1, right? In, in the chapter where we were, where he says, uh, there is no condemnation to those who who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because if you're in Christ Jesus, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. So that means, right, that you are not under that law. Therefore, that's why there is no condemnation to you. It says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Because if you're in Christ, you live by the law of faith. And if you're in Christ, that means you already put your faith in Jesus. So how could anyone condemn you for living under, for, for, any failure, quote unquote, supposedly under the law of Moses, when that's not the law that you, how can someone condemn you if you live in Kentucky for a, a law supposedly that you broke that is applicable only in New York? You're innocent of that, right? Now, if you lived in New York, you'd be guilty of it. But since you don't and you live in Kentucky, then you're not guilty of that law, right? You can't be held accountable to a law that is not applicable to you, right? I, that, I mean, no one would agree with that, right? No one would agree with that. The problem that, that many Christians have and the problem that individuals have in general, that people have in general, is that they, they, either, they are either a law unto themselves or they put themselves under the under law of their own making or they put themselves under the law of Moses, right? So here he says, Again, just reading again from verse number 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. You also see the purpose of the law there, right? That, that, ev- that all the world may become guilty before God and see, right, in that guilt and in that condemnation that they need a Savior, right? In other words, the, the law shows you your poverty, Right? The law shows you your poverty. And when you see your poverty and God says, right, that he can make you rich, you'll gravitate to that, right? When you see your poverty, right, you, people that see their poverty many times is, it, they, not all the time, but many times when people see their poverty, they gravitate to their need for a savior, right? Not every person, but many people do, right? If you came into the kingdom, you came into the kingdom because you recognize that poverty, right? Because you recognize that poverty. Um... In verse number 20, 320, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in other words, right, the, 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 a, a law of works, regardless of whether that it's the law of Moses or a, a law of your own making, those things in the law of Moses are all good. And the things that you call good may very well be good, right? But the fact that you cannot keep them, what, what comes out of that way of living is the knowledge that you can't. In other words, the knowledge of sin. The knowledge that even though you live with a mindfulness, right, of works and the mindfulness on what you think you need to do, your consistent failure and sin or wrongdoing, right? You live constantly then with the knowledge of what you cannot do, the knowledge of deeds that you don't agree with, the impotence to be able to perform them, and the knowledge of the things that you cannot do. Now, if you're, if you're in the spirit living that way, that's unfortunate, right? Because in you, you have the power towards all things, right? 
but yet you're living with a consciousness of a law that you are not under. Therefore, then you're, again, still accusing and excusing your behavior, not knowing that the Lord has already set you free from the law of Moses and that you're only to live by the law of faith and that all things are allowable for you. Not everything is profitable for you to do, but all things are permissible to you. Why? Because of the fact that that's not the law that you live under. You live under one law, the law of faith, right? One law, the law of faith. Maybe let me just mention this to you. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, we don't necessarily have to go there, but in Hebrews chapter 10, it says that, that the, knowledge, the knowledge of sin, it talks about the knowledge of sin, but it, it talks about it in this way, kind of, it talks about sin consciousness, right? That, 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 the, that by the law was always the consciousness of sin. In other words, there was never, it, it was always about the knowledge of what you had done wrong, the shortcomings, right? So when you talk about sin consciousness or the knowledge of sin, in other words, the consciousness of sin comes from the constant reminder of sin, the knowledge of sin. So instead of growing in the knowledge, and we've talked about this many, 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 many times, right? Growing in the knowledge of what Jesus has done, what, what, what is the contrary to that, right? Living in the knowledge of what Christ has done and set you free from or living in the knowledge of your failures, right? Living in the knowledge of your shortcomings, living in the knowledge of some, some code that you're not able to keep uh, uh, or the law of Moses that you're not able to live up to. But instead, right, he tells us, be mindful of what I've done. Know that what you have is because of the fact that I've provided it for you, right? In other words, putting all of the credit on Jesus for his labor and none on yours, right? In other words, without Jesus completely poor, with Jesus made rich, but by, totally by his works, right? Totally by his own works. Um, so Romans 10, 2 talks, and I don't know if we'll get into it later, but it talks about that, about the sin consciousness, that if, if there was a way that under the law of works, um, th that s the sacrifices that were done under the law could have perfected men, then the, the offerings or those sacrifices would have ceased, right? And, and, um, and, then, and then those, th th those comers or, th or those worshipers would have had then no more consciousness of sin. But today, right, we, we live, today we live under, under that fulfilled, right? We see the sacrifice of Jesus won for all time. And because Jesus sacrificed himself once for all time and the sacrifices for our sins have ceased, we, we have no need to live with a consciousness of sin, right? We, we, we can live with a consciousness of what Christ has done. In other words, we can live with a mindfulness of what Christ has done. Guilt and condemnation, wh where does that fit? Where does guilt and condemnation fit in the, in the mind of a believer? Guilt and condemnation can only exist under a law of works, right? Because if, it's not, if you're not under a law of works, wh where could guilt and condemnation come from, right? The only time that an individual can feel guilty or feel condemned is that when they've broken a law or they've broken a standard of living, right? And if, and if the only standard of living that God holds us to, literally a standard to live by, is faith in Jesus, right? Then wh where would guilt and condemnation ever come from, right? There would be no room for guilt and condemnation. So anytime you're ever feeling guilty or feeling condemned, right, you know that your mindfulness is not on what Christ has done, but on what you're doing. It's never then on what Christ has done. It's always based on what you're doing today. Right? I mean, again, the church today doesn't live with the knowledge of the fact that they are not in the flesh and that they're in the spirit. And even if they talk about that, they don't know exactly what that means, right? Because, in other words, they consider themselves in the spirit but still living over here and dabbling here in all this in a way that they can't help it until Jesus comes back, right? But that's not reality, right? That's, they're, they're, living, they're living in some kind of a make-believe world of their own making with a, rules and standards of men, right? So, so you live here born again but living in a world with rules and regulations that are all made of men, made by men, all written in chalk on blackboards, right, that should be erased and should be wiped out, but just written on blackboards, right, and tried to be impressed upon men, but they're rules and regulations that are not put by God, they're just men subjecting themselves to their own rules and regulations, right, just man-made man -made stuff, man-made religion. Um, in... So, 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 so let's talk a little bit about what's, what's changed, right? Let's go to John chapter 1, right? John chapter 1, and I think we've been talking all along about the differences, right? 
But John chapter 1, it says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? So you were, we'll read it in a second, but there, there is a huge distinction in what, in what happened to us, but it's because of what Jesus did. So up until the time of Jesus coming, people basically lived by the law of works, right? Now, when he came, when Jesus came, it says even though the, 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 the world was under a law of works, right, he came and he brought, right, right, he brought the grace of God, right? He brought the grace of God. So, so, it, so through Moses came the law of works, through Jesus came grace, right? Through grace and truth. This is for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? Um, in Romans chapter 4, and I, I know we're reading a lot, but this is good. Romans chapter 4, and verse number 5. You see many, many references to Romans it says, but to him who does not, does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, right? So, so even though, right, the, the, what was going on in the world at the time was the law lived under, the, the world lived under a law of works. Now, Jesus came and bought grace and truth, right? He brought grace and truth. So, so what happened there is that anyone that believes right? Anyone that believes, it says, it says, believes and does not work. In other words, that goes from a law of works mentality, right? To, uh, to a mentality of what Jesus has done. In other words, believing in what he's done. Now, pe people will read this and say, believes on him, but they're not kind of getting it. It's like, you know, there's these, those, these Barna surveys that are done, if, if they're still done. They were done years ago. Um, uh, and they would ask people all over, you know, the United States and in different countries, do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? So people, when they read this and it says, do you believe on him, right? They, they think, okay, it's just if you believe in Jesus, right? But there's a difference between believing that Jesus existed or believing somehow in your mind that, yeah, he is the son of God to believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he came, right, full of grace and truth and accomplished the work that the father had for him to do. And what you're believing is with the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, that you believe that what he was doing was taking your sin, justifying the ungodly, justifying those that needed to be justified, right? That Jesus justified those that needed to be justified who could not justify themselves, who could not make them themselves righteous but needed a righteousness that would be as a come as a free gift he says but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly so what you're believing is right you're living under a law of works and then what you're believing is in his work that's that's what made the difference that's the change right i went from believing in my work to believing his work from believing my work Right? Believing in my work, living, living by my works, right? To believing in his work, right? It's not just believing in Jesus that he, that he came and I believe that he's the son of God, that he was a prophet. No, no. You have to believe in what he did. You have to believe in what he came to do. You have to believe in what he came to change, right? He came to change everything. He didn't come to supplement you. He came to change everything about you. You are nothing like you used to be. Nothing like you used to be. There is thinking that remains, but you yourself, you are nothing like you used to be. He changed everything about you, and there was nothing about you that was good enough to still remain. When you were made a new creation, there was nothing of your old self that was worth leaving there, right? He wiped it all out. He made, gave you a clean slate. You're a brand new creation, right? Completely brand new. So those that believe on the work of Jesus Christ, right? You hear us all the time at this church talk about the labor of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus, because that's the huge thing, right? You lived by a law of works. Now you live by the work of Jesus, right? By what he has done, by what he has accomplished, right? Those who receive the abundance of grace, though, that everything that he's freely given, and by the gift of righteousness, right? Everything we live by is, is something that we have not labored for, right? Everything that we have today, we did not labor for. Everything that, everything that, that we have been made, 
is a result of not what I have done or could ever do, but as a result of what he did. You go from your works to his works, right? You go from your works to his works. Um, let's take a look at, uh, look at Romans chapter 6. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Romans 6, and look at verse number 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. That's talking about the one that's been made new, right? Dominion is power, right? Dominion is, you know, exercising lordship over you, right? Dominion. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You are not under the law, but under grace. The law of what? The law of works. What law is that? The Ten Commandments. You are not under the law, you are not under the law, but under grace. When did grace come? When Christ came, right? When Jesus came, we read from John 1, he came full of grace and truth, right? He came full of grace and truth. Grace came, in other words, when, when things were available to us, things were made available to us freely, right? When Christ came and it was fully established when he died on the cross. In other words, the disciples were living under the grace of God, right? They were receiving and functioning in things that they didn't work for. They were receiving and functioning in a power of an age to come that was not of their making, right? The, the power that they had where they were casting out devils, that wasn't of their making. That wasn't of their, they, they didn't earn that power because of something that they had done, right? They were sharing, right? They were sharing in, in the grace of God. They were sharing in that power which was of Christ that was with them. If he wasn't with them, right, they, they wouldn't be sharing in that, right, at the time. But it says that sin shall not have dominion over you, but why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. Now, there's, there's a, a truth here, right? That the reason why sin itself, right, the, the, the excuse that we had here when we were under sin and being under the dominion of sin is because that's where you lived, right? The, 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 strength, the strength of sin in your life at the time before you were born again was the law of works that you were living under, right? That is, the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. So whether you were a law unto yourself, you had a law unto yourself of your own making that agreed with the law of Moses, right? Agreed with these right things to do. I'm not saying that every law that you had upon yourself was in agreement with the law of Moses because there were standards that you had that, that probably God didn't even bring up then. But, but the point is that any standard that you had or people that lived under the law of Moses, that, that is of their own making, right? That, that was of their own, that, that was a bondage that they lived under. So therefore, for they were under the dominion of sin. But if you have come out from under that law, if you are not, no longer under the law of works, right? It's, again, you've moved from your works to his works, right? So you're not, no longer under a law of works. You cannot be under a law of works and yet live depending on the, on the work of Jesus Christ, right? That, that's why he fulfilled all of that, right? It, 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 that you, you, live, you live as an individual, you live as an individual that w lived perfectly under the law, even though you don't live perfectly according to that law, because you're living not by your works, but by his perfect work. You're, you're living by a perfect sacrifice. You're, you're, you're living by a once-for-all sacrifice that has perfected you, even though you couldn't perfect yourself. He perfected you, right? He made you perfect. You're a brand new, perfect individual, right? Perfect individual, heavenly and not earthly. He says, for, the, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So the distinction that he brings there is, you're not under a law of works, but you're under a, uh, the, the, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which was freely given to you. The grace of God. Grace came through Jesus Christ, right? If Jesus would not have come, you could not be under grace. If it were not for him, you could not live under grace, right? You would still be dead in your sins under the law, right? Still in bondage to where you were. Um, Romans 5, verse number 17. You know, when we talk about how, you know, the strength of sin is the law, 
if, if the law would still have, um, if the law was, the strength of sin, sorry, the, I said the strength of the law, but the strength of sin is the law. If, if you recognize the fact that you're not under law anymore, do you see though how sin then has no strength, right? And then death by connection then has no bearing on you anymore, right? Because the reality is you're not under the law. Now, any time that you put yourself under the law, then, then here comes then guilt and condemnation. Here comes carnal thinking. Because again, all that you've done, just as simple as I can put it, right? You have slid from the work of Jesus to your own works. That, that's all that has, has happened, right? You slid from what he did to what you can do or from what he did to what you have done, right? It's, it, it just all becomes about you. You know, I, I can't help that thing has been resonating in my mind, right? If we could just get over ourselves, right? Because we, we make it about ourselves instead of making it about what he's done, right? We, we learned that way. We, we, we came and became obedient to a form of doctrine that was all about, that form of doctrine we became obedient to, right, was the obedience of faith, which is all about what Jesus has done. We were obedient to that. In other words, we heard it. We loved it. We believed it, right? We were saved by, by the knowledge of what Christ has done. Anytime that we slip back into what I could do or what I have done, you're slipping away from the message of the cross, right? You're slipping away from the work of Jesus Christ, right? Because you're focused on what you did or what you could have done or what you didn't do, right? Instead of focusing again, being mindful of the things of the Spirit, which is always going to be the same. The mindfulness of the Spirit is always going to be bringing your attention to the, to, to the works of Jesus Christ instead of the law of works, right? Fleshly works. In, um, what did I say? Did I say Romans chapter 5, 17? For if by, Romans 5, 17, for if by, if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, right, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. So, so you, see, you, you see two things reigning, right? You see, you see death reigning and then, and then you see uh, reigning in the life of God, right? You, you see, there are two completely opposite things. It's, it's understandable, completely understandable why death could reign, right? Because it was about the sin of Adam. It's about what men did. It's about what men do. It's about, it's, it was all about carnal, fleshly works, about what Adam did or about what you do, about what you didn't do, about what Adam didn't do. It's just all about men, the do's and don'ts of, of men, the things that men do or don't do, about the works of men. But when you move away from the works of men, which is the law of works, right? When you move away from the work of men and then you come over to the work that he did then you're over here on the abundance of the grace of God that he's provided right the abundance of the grace of God that in other words he's provided he's provided uh, grace for the world right he, he, he there's an abundance of grace and a gift of righteousness in other words uh, a justification for your sins a righteousness right a standing with god a, a position that you have that has nothing to do with what you have done but again everything to do with what he has done the, the way in our thinking to constantly stay here is to have the discernment to understand and what I'm thinking about it, is this in line with what he's done or in line with what I did or what didn't do or neglected to do or whatever, right? The, the, the way to stay out of uh, carnal mindedness is, is simple and singular. It, it comes back obviously to the one thing, right? Mindful of what he's done. Mindful of what he's done. Mindful on the labor of Jesus Christ, right? It says, uh, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, it says, um, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, which we talked about before, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life, right? So he justified the ungodly. He justified the ungodly, which were all of us, right? Now, the funny thing is that there are some ungodly people who actually consider themselves to be righteous, to be good, right? By themselves, without Jesus, right? He can't do anything for those, right? 
He can't do anything for those. But for those that consider themselves to be ungodly, that, that have come to the, understand their poverty, right? If you're unsaved today and you come to a place where you've understood your poverty, you understand that you cannot, the good news is he did and it's free, right? He did and it was free to us. He's, he's, he's finished, right? And it's all for the taking, right? He's finished and it's all for the taking. Um, in verse number 19, for by one man's disobedience, whose disobedience? A man's disobedience, right? Whose disobedience? A man's disobedience. It, it was all about human disobedience, human works, right? F- works of the flesh, right? By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, by the obedience of Christ, right? By the obedience of Christ, by the cross, many will be made righteous. Many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so, as, so that as sin reigned in death, which is understandable again, right? It's understandable that, that, sin, reigned in, that sin reigned in death. Right? That's understandable because of where we were, when where, we, where we were before we were born again. Uh, so that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? In other words, we, we live today, where we live today, when we are mindful of what he's done. We're, we're not mindful of our works. We're mindful of his works. Right? What, what happens? It says that grace then begins to reign Through righteousness, grace is able to freely reign through a righteousness that is a gift to us. In other words, do do you see kind of like the un, the, I'll just make up a word, the unhinderedness that the power of God has in your life? In other words, you were freely given all this stuff, this inheritance of God. And the, what it works through is a righteousness that was a gift to you. So, so think about this. If the grace of God in me is so unhindered, then what could possibly be in its way, right? If the grace of God in me works so unhindered through righteousness to life to me, right? Life to my mortal body, life to anything that is mine, life to anything that I touch, life to anyone that is in association with me. If it works so unhinderedly, then what is the problem? Whenever you get away from his work and you get on yours, when you get on your work, that is the hindrance, right? When, when you live in the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, which has nothing to do with you, it has everything to do with him, you understand like the focus on what Jesus has done? Like we say that like it's old news, right? The focus in living based on what Jesus has done, not what you do. It's not about how many times you read your Bible. It's not about, about how many chapters you read. It's not whether you read the Bible this morning or this night. Anything that has anything to do with what you do is the problem, Right? That is the issue. When you, when you allow your mind to just rejoice in what he has done, the grace of God, the power of God can flow effortlessly through you, right? Because you're just growing in everything that he's done. You're rejoicing in the things that you know and the new things that God can continue to teach you about the finished work and the finality of what he's done. The, the grace of God works, right? Reigns, reigns through righteousness, of which you already possess, you know? In other words, the grace of God works through something you already have. So if the grace of God works freely and reigns unto, unto life, right, through a righteousness that is already yours, the only thing that could ever hinder that are thoughts that are not in line with the works of Christ, but instead are just in line with works of the flesh, right? Just in line with works of the flesh. Um, Let's see. Let, 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 let's, let's start wrapping up here real quick. Um, okay. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go here. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to, I think we're going to end there. Romans chapter 8. And let's... Go ahead and read again verse number 9. I think we already read that, but we're going to read it again. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. Listen to this again. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You know, if you ever, um, you know, you're sitting in front of your boss at work, right? And, and it's review time. 
Right? And they begin to tell you, you know, this good thing about you, and this good thing about you, and this good thing about you, right? You know, that, that's, it's kind of like the, um, uh, you know, you, you would feel so good about all these compliments and all this stuff, but then, you know, if you hear some negatives, you get, you're like, okay, I got to work on that, I got to do this. But when, when, when you read this, right, when you read this and you hear, you hear all of these awesome things that, lo- that the Lord is saying about who he's made you and all these awesome things about what he's done, he's telling you, listen, he's saying to you, he's saying to you, you are not in the flesh any longer, but you are in the spirit, right? If indeed he's saying, my spirit lives on the inside of you, of which you would say, yes, the spirit of God lives in me. So the reality and the good news and the truth about that is that you are no more in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. That means, Lord, there has been a drastic change, right? I am, I am really, truly, truly not the same, right? right? I am not the same as I used to be. I am completely brand new, right? That is an awesome thing to understand, right? And I'm, I'm not sure how many people understand that, right? We, we are totally brand new. I am nothing like I used to be, right? But you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit of the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, so if you don't have the spirit of Christ, that means you're still living here by your work. You can't live based on the work of God because you have not received that grace. You have not received the abundance of his grace and of the gift that he provided, right? You haven't received what he freely is offering to the world. Not what he's offered to Christians, what he's offering to the world, right? There's much of the world that has heard it and maybe rejects it just because they don't understand it or don't know it. And there's some of the world that's beginning to see it a little bit at a time. But but he's saying, he's saying, if you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, then you're none of his. And if Christ is in you, which you agreed to before, you said, yes, the spirit of God is in me. If Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life, again, because of what? Righteousness. The spirit that is in you that he just said, if you, if you have the spirit of God and you nodded yes, right? You nodded yes to that. Then he said that, that if you have his spirit, you are his. You, are, you came from him, right? If you have the spirit of God, you are mine. You were born of me. And he's saying then, if you're of me, then that spirit my spirit that is in you, that spirit is life to you because of righteousness, which we saw before was a gift to you, which you also possess. So if you nod yes to I have the spirit of God and you nod yes to the righteousness of God, right, that we were made, right? He who knew no sin became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God. So we are delineating there the path by which we were made righteous, which has nothing to do with your work. It has only something to do with his work. So there is no work that you do to maintain that righteousness. How could you maintain something that you didn't earn in the first place, right? If you didn't earn it and it was given to you as a free gift, how could you, how could you maintain it, right? It's based on his work, and he still remains today our high priest seated at the right hand of the Father. So his work still demands the same respect that it did the day that you were born again, right? The respect that you gave the finished work of Jesus Christ is the same respect we ought to give to the finished work of Jesus Christ today, 25 years after you've been saved, still deserves the same respect. It's his work, not yours. You're not part of the equation, right? So he says... If, if that spirit that lives in you, right, is life to you because of righteousness, again, you see that there is nothing blocking it. There's, there's no hindrance there on the part of God. There's no hindrance on the part of the spirit of God in you. The only thing holding that back, really, is you growing in the knowledge of what you have, right? Not, not having a mindfulness on your work. Having a mindfulness on your work is a hindrance to you growing in the knowledge of what he did, right? You, 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 you follow, if you're, if you're concentrating and you're mindful of carnal things, you're not gonna be mindful of spiritual things, right? So he's saying, be mindful of the things that I have done. Be mindful of the things. In other words, let me teach you. Listen to me and I will teach you. Listen to me and I will teach you, right? Listen to me and I will teach you. Verse number 11 says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it says he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. You know, it's just, it's just really, um, just simply, you know what, to close here, that, that when, when you, when you begin to see what we were looking at before and you, and you can say, you know what, Lord, when I was in the flesh, to talk about all these things properly, in their proper context, the way they truly are, right? 
You used to be in the flesh. You're no more. Today you are in the spirit. Yes, you are. Amen, right? Today you're in the spirit. You're not in the flesh. So then you begin to think, what are all of the benefits of mine for being in the spirit, right? Being, uh, being of God, being born of God. Do you see, you see how when, when years ago the Lord began to talk to us about the finished work of Jesus Christ, th- that was a enormous turning point, right? But why is it? Because it simply took us from a thinking that said it's about what I have done to a thinking that says it's all about what he's done. Not some about what he's done. It's all about what he's done and nothing about what you've done. Where there is disagreement here in the middle among among the church today is that some will say, well, it's about what he's done, but it's also about what I do. That right there, if you wanted to put a pin in the problem, that's the problem. Anytime that we mix our works with his, that's the problem. When you're, when you're empath- even if you're just growing now and you don't know a ton about it, but if we're growing in the, just the knowledge of what he's done, you're going you're gonna to be right as rain constantly. Constantly you're going to be right. You know why? Because you're weighing everything that you hear. Is this about what he did about, or about what I can do? Whenever anything slips you back into this camp over here about my works and a law of works or my standard or what I did or what I didn't do, that's a problem. You know, sometimes you think like, how can I know, Lord, like, if, am I doing the right thing? You know, am I, is, it about, am I, is it about me reading my Bible, not reading my Bible? Is it about me doing this or not doing this? You, you're actually identifying the problem. You're saying that you're des- the way you describe it is it's about what you're doing. It's about your Bible reading habits. It's about how many verses you've read. It's about how many verses you have memorized. It's about your eloquence and your speaking. or what. You- it's all about what you do, right? Anything, anytime you-, you could be talking about godly things, but if it's about what you do, that is a problem, right? If we simplify it down to the bare bones, right, it is always about what he did and only about what he did and everything that you have been based on what he did and nothing about what we've done. If you want to know if you're thinking right, is it based on what he's done? Are your thoughts in line with what he's done? Is that what you're thinking about or are you thinking about what you did or what you didn't do, right? That's a problem. Today, the church beats itself up, right, like I used to. Did I read my Bible today, yes or no? And if I didn't, I'm going to have a bad day. Why? Because your living is based on what you did or didn't do. That's your standard. Your standard is, is did I read my Bible today? It may be, quote unquote, supposedly a good thing to read your Bible, but you've made it into a law of works, right? When people make faith a law of works, right? It's not about, do I believe what Jesus did? It's, oh, I neglected to believe. I didn't believe, I didn't believe enough. I didn't do this. I, that's the problem. Put a pin in that because that's the issue, right? It's about what you did or what you didn't do. When you make it about what he did and your thinking is about what you have done, Jesus, what time you read your Bible and when you prayed or when you didn't or when you got up or when you didn't get up or whatever, all that other stuff, it, it, it loses its meaning, right? Because it's not about the time of day that you read your Bible. It's not about how many times you've prayed. It's not whether you remember to do this or not. It's not whether you said, I acknowledge you, Jesus. It's not about that. It's about actually just doing, right? It's about just being, saying, Lord, you know what? I just acknowledge you right now, Lord, and I acknowledge you because I want you to teach me. I want you to remind me, Lord, of the things that I should be mindful of, Lord, and just let him do it. Let him teach you. Let him remind you. And what he's going to remind you of is what he's done. Thank you, Jesus. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reformed Church, you can do so at reforminus.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.